This is a public service announcement. In honour of the death of Queen Elizabeth the sequel, the partly political broadcast podcast will be strictly adhering to the ban on all comedy or humour that is in place during the period of mourning. Therefore, this episode will be in absolutely no way different to any previous ones. Hello and welcome to the Partly Political Broadcast, the comedy politics podcast that will be observing a 10-day period of mourning. By that, I mean I'll be having only breakfast for all of my meals. I'm Tiernan Duyebin this week as the Queen dies just a day and a half after meeting the new Prime Minister and marionette in a tumble dryer, Liz Truss, it is now clear that she really, really did represent the mood of the entire nation. God save our... Oh, mate, come on, God, you had one job. Yes, it is all change on this perfectly normal island. This time last week we had a different Prime Minister and a Queen, but here we are now with a new but equally shit and depressingly awful Prime Minister who, hey, at least brushes her hair but moves like someone has glued cotton buds together and thrown a sack over them, and we have a King. One who takes cash donations from Saudi tycoons is big on homeopathy, even though I'm not really sure how he thinks water can have a memory when his own family can't seem to remember what his brother Andrew has been up to, and his name, King Charles III, sounds like Cockney rhyming slang for needing the loo. Well, I suppose he will now reside on the throne for quite a while. It is always the last part of the trilogy that's the worst, isn't it? Oh well. It was, of course, a very, very big shock to the nation that Queen Elizabeth II, aged only a sprightly 96 years old, died last week. But I suppose that is what will happen under a Conservative government that makes everyone work well past the age of retirement. At least she doesn't have to write a letter to herself now. I mean, I really hate the idea of writing to me, even though some people reckon it's therapeutic. Some papers said her death, following nearly a century of a very well-lived multi-millionaire life and then surrounded by family as she went peacefully, was the saddest moment in the last 70 years of British history. True, true. I mean, how could all the disasters, wars, terror attacks, pandemics, deaths caused by austerity, police murdering people, that time Madonna fell off the stage at the Brits, or the existence of Greg Wallace come even close to the absolute tragedy of an old lady dying of old age? It is because the Queen did so much for the country that her death was so sad. I mean, she posed for every stamp and coin without ever complaining. She took on the mantle of all that wealth gained from colonisation, slavery and imperialism without ever grumbling about it. Never once did she roll her eyes at having to give her son millions of pounds to insist he's not a massive pedo. There was also that time she failed to get a government poverty fund to heat Buckingham Palace and she had to use taxpayers' money instead, which must have just been really hard. And, of course, she jumped out of a plane at the Olympics and talked to a CGI bear. Can you name a woman that's done more for the UK? No, of course not. No woman I know has ever talked to a CGI bear and probably never, ever will. When the Queen died, there were double rainbows outside Buckingham Palace, which showed without a doubt that her reign had ended and um, it was now sunny. Someone spotted a cloud that looked just like her Madge too, which must have been really, really disappointing for Lizzie, who was clearly trying to do a Mufasa on her son but got the wrong bit of sky. I do hope she had the James Earl Jones voice ready too. With Queen Elizabeth the sequel gone, it is undoubtedly the end of an era. We are no longer Elizabethans, which no one I knew thought we were anyway. We are now uh, charlatans. Charlie Big Potatoes? I'm not really sure. I do, however, regret buying a new book of stamps just two weeks ago. So now we're all observing 10 days of mourning, or at least occasionally seeing it pop up on Twitter and Facebook from people you haven't seen in 10 years and intend to keep it that way. It turns out what the Queen would have wanted, because she had an excellent sense of humour, you know, was for there to be no comedy on state television at all and for events like Last Night of the Proms, where they played all her top tunes, to just not go ahead. The Met Office stopped forecasting because what the Queen would have wanted was you going outside inappropriately dressed for the weather. And all the football got cancelled because she loved sport and really it's very lucky that no one ever used to make a point about how much she liked food or breathing or we could all be in quite a lot of trouble by now. We'd only ever heard stories about how great the Queen was, but if all her last wishes were for the entire country to have a really shit 10 days, then it doesn't paint the best picture of her match. Not that she needed that, as she already had that one from Rolf Harris. Then again, I do like the idea of thinking, well, I've died, so I may as well ruin someone else's life too. Give a shit. Although she did already do that by appointing Liz Truss to the post of Prime Minister and all the previous Prime Ministers before that. It's very different to when lots of people died during the pandemic, as the way to respect them was by getting back to the office and having £10 off at Nando's. But because the Queen earned her way into being born into her family, everything had to stop. 
I would like to suggest that this isn't at all what she wanted, say I, a royal expert, and by that I mean I've seen some one P's and two P's before, but instead, this is mere age-old tradition, the very same tradition that means her son is now king, even though it'd been much better if there'd been some sort of gladiator-style reality TV show challenge to find us a new one. Tradition means even the Bank of England postponed their new eye-wateringly damaging high inflation rates in honour of the Queen, which is very interesting. Is the way to stop inflation just for national treasures to pop their clogs? Will we see the government announce that instead of giving workers much needed pay rise, that they'll have to have some sort of big wood chopping machine and when we next hear cost of living is creeping up again, they'll give Attenborough a big shove into it? The Prime Minister Liz Truss, ugh, sorry, just saying that makes me wretch a bit in my own mouth, ugh, sorry, ugh. Prime Minister Liz Truss uh, also went along with this tradition by making sure absolutely nothing was remotely enjoyable when she delivered a speech outside number 10, where she sounded like the child at a school performance who'd been handed something by the teacher to read because her own writing was too embarrassing to be heard in public. The Prime Minister said Queen Elizabeth was the very spirit of Great Britain, which I suppose suggests the country was already dead. Footage has emerged of Teenage Trust saying anti-monarchy statements and calling the royal family disgraceful, but it can't be used against her as all her opinions have a shelf life of around two minutes. I can't imagine she has ever given the same answer twice, and I reckon she repeatedly fails at website capture tests. In France, she's apparently become known as the Iron Weather Vane, which doesn't feel right, not least because I'd never trust a weather report from her. Oh god, that's not how it's going to be done now with the Met Office forecast stopping, is it? Ugh, we're in so much trouble. Liz Truss's Twitter statement about the Queen's death was at least a little bit better in that she was so obviously sad about it that the photo only had her taking up half the image as opposed to a normal selfie like she does for everything else. Having truly terrible oratory skills is a precedent Liz Truss had set just days before, with her first speech as Prime Minister cementing that she has the incredible skill of being able to talk for quite some time without saying anything at all. It's just a real shame she went into politics rather than sleep tapes. Aside from killing the Queen, I mean, she was only 96, so you don't just die at that age, do you? It's a bit suspicious, right? God, I do hope there's inqu- No, I do hope there's an inquiry. Maybe it's because there can only be one Liz in a top job at a time. Probably tradition or something. Well, aside from that, which you have to admit is a pretty rough start to your first week on the job, things have been going great for our new Prime Minister. She very quickly filled her cabinet with people so inept at their jobs and indeed pretending to be human beings that it almost makes her look competent in comparison. Well, almost. Okay, not really. Deputy Prime Minister and Health Secretary as Bearskin Hats had a hard life, Therese Kofi, a woman whose main achievements so far include being the head of the Department of Work and Pensions when they cut people's benefits during the pandemic and said maybe they could just work more hours to make up for it, you know, when no one could go to work in case they die. Kofi also refused to release reports on how many people had died due to her failings, which is weird, she'd think it'd be the sort of thing she'd want to boast to people about. Everything around Therese Kofi suggests that you'd only have to hang around with her for five minutes at most before you'd heard her say that poor people should be eaten and she'd wafted a fart at a homeless person as it's what they deserve for not trying hard enough. The new Chancellor is Kwasi Kwarteng, a man seemingly designed by a protractor who recently supported former MP and Badger botherer Owen Patterson when he was found to have been lobbying up to the eyeballs. So it's really good to know that Kwarteng won't just hand out money to anyone, he'll have to have been paid by them with some cash in brown envelopes first. Zippy the Pinhead tribute act James Cleverly is Foreign Secretary, despite it being very likely that his concept of international relations is having a Facebook friend who lives on Canvey Island. The Home Secretary is workhouse elf Suella Bravman, who's probably already in the channel trying to sink her teeth into dinghies. And then other lowlights include Agatha Christie's The Mystery of the Blue Drain, Jacob Rees-Mogg, becoming Business, Energy and Industrial Secretary, an appointment that can only lead to an incinerator being built to burn orphans for money, or an insistence that by helping Cthulhu to rise, we'll never need gas heating again. Although that wouldn't be as bad a plan as the one that's actually being pushed through. At least Cthulhu rising out of the water would lower sea levels a little bit. The government, though, are going back to focusing on extracting fossil fuels, and I do hope they start with the lumps of coal that the cabinet have in place of hearts. At the time of a climate crisis, you might think reverting to doing the exact thing that kickstarted the climate crisis in the first place would be a terrible idea. And you'd be right, unless it sort of works like when you persuade a kid to stop smoking by making them smoke 400 packets all at once. Jacob Rees-Mogg is a climate denier because they didn't know how the ozone worked in Victorian times and he could only read things that had been written on manuscripts or predicted by soothsayers. It's also likely, no, not because he's a decrepit fossil himself, but because Jacob Rees-Mogg is the shareholder of a company with investments in fossil fuel companies, much like how the Prime Minister Liz Truss got some rather large donation sums to her leadership campaign from oil giants and energy companies. So it's clearer than British skies, or indeed waters, why Liz Truss's big energy freeze plan is mostly to give energy companies loads of money to charge us more than they did before, but lucky you, it's not as much as they could have done. 
great. I am so grateful to have someone in charge who'd consider they'd done a good job if during a hostage situation they persuaded the kidnapper to only cut five of the victim's fingers off instead of all ten. Actually, that's not fair. Liz Truss would have bored them to sleep after two minutes of talking into a loud hailer and then it could have gone in and freed people. So, the government will give energy companies £150 billion in taxpayer funds to freeze prices at over £1,000 more than they were a year ago when people already couldn't afford them, but Truss insists she's on the side of the people here. Yes, like a thorn. There's also been a decision to renew fracking because what would be really helpful is taking eight years to get enough gas to heat 18 homes, all the while causing earthquakes. I suppose on the plus side, any toxicity in the water might kill off all the sewage that's in there, and if there's enough tremors, the ground might finally swallow as whole. Every cloud. Hang on, Liz Truss said the Queen was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Does that mean she wanted to frack her? Awful. The only supposed glimmer of hope is that the British Bill of Rights, as proposed by former Justice Secretary and vacuum-packed human Dominic Raab, has now been scrapped. And I would like to assume that this is because the new government value human rights, but it's more likely that within a few months there just won't be enough of them left to fill an entire policy with. But of course, we've got to wait and see what's next, as to pay respects to the late Queen, Parliament has also been suspended for 10 days, you know, just after their seven-week recess and before conference season starts and they all take time off again to go drinking. Then again, I feel there's some sort of pleasing revenge if the Queen has managed to prorogue Parliament herself this time. The Liberal Democrats have already cancelled their conference in the same way that other events that would have had low attendance probably used it as a good excuse to cancel too. Labour will start theirs in two weeks, unless everyone is still sad by then, but they'll be buoyed by Labour leader and man who appears to be entirely pleated trousers, Keir Starmer, doing a tribute to the Queen that was better received than the Prime Minister's. I mean, even by me, but only in the way that if you compared anything Liz Truss said with a car alarm going off while a tap dripped, the latter would still be more interesting. Keir Starmer said Queen Elizabeth did not simply reign over us, she lived alongside us, which is news to me, but then we've never been sure who's at number seven. I've not seen her post anything on next door though, and people don't even use a pseudonym to be racist on there. The Queen's funeral, and as a result bank holiday, is next Monday, which incidentally is also international talk like a pirate day, so hopefully all official announcements will be about HRH. Then King Charles will begin his not very long reign, I mean he's 73 already, so unless they're going to do that brain swap thing like in Get Out with one of the grandkids, it's not going to be more than a decade, right? Well, he's going to begin it with a UK tour, which is going to confuse anyone buying tickets who thinks they're going to see the artist formerly known as Prince. It was announced Liz Truss was going to be accompanying the King, but then after everyone pointed out the royal family should be apolitical, it was quickly announced that she wasn't, so now she'll just be attending services of reflection, because no doubt she thinks it'll be a brilliant hour of looking at herself in the mirror. Charles won't be paying inheritance tax on the fortune gained from his mother, which many are angry about, but I suppose it'd only be coming back to him anyway, so I guess this ends up being quicker. Will this signal the very overdue end of the Commonwealth, which many of the remaining countries were seeking to leave even before they knew they'd have to accommodate Charles? I mean, that must be like hoping you don't get a visit from your landlord and then hearing their irritating son who only talks about herbal tea is doing the inspection instead. Could it be that Charles's interest in stopping climate change will mean he actually causes difficulty for a government that just wants to frack everything up? Or will he mostly be meeting CGI bears, which, as we know, is most important? Only time will tell, but not right now, as the speaking clock has been temporarily stopped out of respect for the Queen. Apparently she very much liked time, so it's what she would have wanted. In other news, Ukraine has rapidly regained significant amounts of territory from Russian occupation, and apparently Russian troops were outnumbered 8-1 to in a counter-attack in Kharkiv. Putin loyalists have started criticising the Russian president, and when you make a figure out of clay but can't be bothered with details, and even Russian state TV has been admitting it's not going great for them. It was only a few weeks ago Putin was claiming Russia had made no losses, but I suppose to be fair, he does know exactly where his troops and vehicles are, it's just that they're no longer in action. It's not the end yet, but it could be a very big turning point. So that, plus knowing there's no way Liz Truss can make a surprise visit till at least next week, has got to bring Ukrainians some hope. Slow news week, eh? Ah, it's been very interesting watching people who usually go, you can't say anything in comedy anymore, immediately having a go at anyone joking about the Queen dying. Which I think ignores how important comedy is for some people in coping with difficult situations, or at least situations where there are news stories about how the Royal Beekeeper had to let the Royal Bees know that they're now owned by Charles. I mean, I joke, but there's probably some diplomatic stuff in there, isn't there? You know, like informing their Queen about the other one. I'm not really sure how it works. 
But if the Queen represented Britain and one of the best British values is supposedly comedy, it is bonkers that the first thing to get scrapped from all the TV schedules um, is comedy. Or like uh, Kevin Bridges' brilliant and fairly tame gags, um, you know, get you vilified for doing it. He was gigging to thousands of people and in Scotland on the night that she died. You can't just sort of uh, go out to a crowd like that and not mention it, hope no one notices. Uh, you, you've got to adapt. And uh, I mean, really, his, his jokes were good. They, they weren't particularly offensive, very weird. But, I mean, shouldn't all of this be comedy? You know, shouldn't the funeral procession be done with a series of silly walks? Uh, that would be really British, wouldn't it? She had a good sense of humour. She'd like that. It's all so boring. Anyway, I am, of course, grumbly uh, because um, it's my agent's first day of school tomorrow and next week was meant to be the first full week of school and now there's a bank holiday in it, so I'm going to have to write next week's show while also doing childcare. Thanks, everyone. That's insensitive. That's what insensitive is, I tell you. Um, oh, and the speaking clock hasn't actually been temporarily stopped. I don't want to scare you. I know you all rely on it loads, but with there not being any clocks around anymore, so just that, that bit was false. Obviously, I know I'm trying to fact-check everything, but that's that bit. Anyway, I hope that intro found the right line to please all of you, or at least only lose me the new listeners that came on board uh, with the show last week. Um, welcome to The Good Ship, this podcast. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, before we tuck into this week's noises, um, firstly, some admin, but important admin, uh, the brilliant, brilliant charity Arts Emergency. Um, they are running their mentoring programme again. Um, the charity supports people aged 16 to 18 in London, Brighton, Manchester and Merseyside who want to pursue a career in the creative or cultural arts industries but don't have the connections or knowledge required or, you know, shitloads of inheritance as is currently needed um so if you join them as a mentor uh you will meet with one of these young people once a month for a year to help guide them with goals gaining skills and getting confidence to do what they'd actually like to do in this world where the arts are being destroyed from all of the educational places and pretty much everywhere else oh joy um but it's a bloody lovely thing to do i i mentored uh someone a few years back it turns out mentoring someone to do stand up it's not easy. You just sort of have to go, yeah, go shout at people in pubs for ages. Um, here's a connection. They'll give you an open spot on a bill with 16 other apps, and it's terrible. Um, so, but it, it was a lot of fun, and uh, the kid did good, even with my terrible advice. Um, and the scheme has helped so many young people get into some great careers that wouldn't have been accessible to them otherwise. So if you'd be interested in, in enrolling as a mentor for Arts Emergency, you can find all details at arts-emergency.org, and I'll put a more direct link in the pod blurb as well. And if you don't want to be a mentor, or um, maybe donate to Arts Emergency instead as they do really great and very, very important stuff. Right, that's that bit. That's the important bit. And the other thing to mention, uh, which is not as important and on a totally different tack to the entire rest of this show, is that my first episode of Hey Dougie um, that I've written is now on BBC iPlayer and it's going to be aired on CBeebies this Thursday the 15th at 7.05am uh, and it's the accessory badge. And I'm so excited that I got to write for a show that... Um, I mean, I was going to say, to put it lightly, but it isn't lightly at all. It, it kept us all sane during lockdowns. I think my, my, my daughter, sorry, my agent has watched every episode about six billion times. Um, and uh, she's she's watched she watched my one uh, and she liked it, but she doesn't like it as much as, as Norrie's first day, which is written by someone else. He's very good as well. And James Watt, he's brilliant. Um, but of course, of course she does. Of course she prefers the number one. Um, but so obviously uh, this only really appeals if you've got small people, but I'm telling everyone as I'm super proud of it it's been animated so amazingly um it's just really exciting to sort of wake up and, and see something you did uh it came through during the pandemic when i had all my stand-up cancelled and i got this writing job and it was a total uh like lifesaver so um we've got another ep coming much much later in the run too but yeah if you've got small kids please check it out right uh, and now on this week's show a chat with dominic caddick from the new economics foundation where we talk about all the things that um selfishly not pausing out of respect for the queen i mean come on cost of living crisis at least a 10 day break right why aren't all the energy bills pausing it's just rude it's just rude I'm not sure if you've heard, what with it being much less important than an old lady dying, but the UK is currently in a cost of living crisis. Luckily, there are ways to get through it, such as inherit a £370 million fortune that you don't have to pay an inheritance tax on, get £86 million a year from the taxpayer and... Oh no, no wait, sorry. I've just checked the small print and apparently there's very specific criteria for who can get that. Ah, shit. Well, look, for the rest of us, uh, you name the thing that's necessary to your life and chances are very high that it's gone up in cost. Unless, of course, you're one of those twats that just replied with something like, all you need is love and then I can't wait to see you try and pay the bills with devotion and a look of logging. No, maybe I'm just cynical and that is the way to soften bailiffs. Who knows? It looks like what everyone will be getting for Christmas is a recession and there's a new gold standard. Sorry, what I mean is that everyone should have invested in Lurpak butter months ago and then we'd all be rich by now. 
Currently, the government's plans to lower inflation appear to be to make us all pay more for energy than we did before, but less than it could have been, which is very much the absolute least they could do. It's like seeing someone losing blood and rather than stitch them back up fully, just doing it halfway and telling them you've saved their life for now, but they will have to be slowly bled out for the rest of it for years to come. But why are we in this situation? Is it because the war in Ukraine has had such a devastating effect it caused ripples in time? So 12 years ago, austerity was brought in by the Conservatives, followed by Brexit, ferry firms without ferries being paid millions of pounds to ferry stuff somehow, and then a pandemic. Or are there other factors, like the last Chancellor, oh no wait, sorry, the last one before the one that was on the run from HMRC, the one, you know, the one before that lost £11 billion somewhere down the back of a very dodgy sofa, and a whole ton of money was spent on Dido Harding taking expensive How to Make an App course that she then failed and had to redo several times. Well, this week I spoke to Dominic Caddick, an assistant researcher at the New Economics Foundation. If you don't know the brilliant NEF, even though they've been on this podcast many a time before, they are all about transforming the economy so it actually works for people and the planet. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? So I asked Dominic all about what a recession means for people who aren't getting all of the inheritance, why it's happening, and if there's anything at all we can do to lessen the effect it will have on us. Spoilers, no, not really, unless you have some brilliant plans as to how to lure Liz Truss into the sea by faking siren voices offering her cheese if she just wades in a little bit further. I spoke to Dominic last Wednesday, so before Nature committed regicide and pre the announcement of the plans to freeze energy bills that still haven't really been properly announced anyway. But still, I'm not sure either of those things would have made much difference to how things will be, and so this chat should still be pretty much up to date. Here is Dominic. Dominic, uh, first question really is, just before we spoke, actually, the Bank of England uh, had said um, it's still very likely that the UK is heading into a recession, um, which is a nicely sort of vague, I, I guess that means we are. Is that where we're going? And, and I wondered, is this where we've always been heading after years of government policies since the financial crash, austerity, everything onwards, or have recent events been more of a catalyst uh, for this? Yes, yeah, so... With a recession, like the technical definition of it is that you have two quarters of um, negative economic growth. So half half a year's worth of negative economic growth. And the thing is, I think currently we've already experienced about a third of uh, half of that even. So one quarter of negative economic growth. And basically we're just waiting for the next one to come about. And therefore we're officially in recession. I mean, I think. The, the, the thing is, for me, though, is that, you know, the reason we sort of care about recessions and want to avoid them is because of, like, the destruction in living standards and all the sort of pain associated with that. But we're currently already seeing that due to the rise in inflation. So, you know, there's lots of stuff out there showing how people's wages are not catching up with inflation. And, you know, that in itself is, you know, cause for concern and stuff that we should already be worrying about you know if in three months time we're officially in a recession the average person is not going to make a difference to them because they're already worse off and like yeah with your question about you know have we always been headed here I think there's like quite an interesting way to think about it so a recession is obviously at the entire UK level but when you look at sort of that definition of negative economic growth, but sort of focus it on like different groups. So like the Northeast, Yorkshire, or, you know, people who are in the poorest 50% of the UK, they've been experiencing negative economic growth in, you know, recent times. Um, I think, you know, between 2010 and 2020, you have like a statistic like the Northeast was in three different recessions, despite the fact the UK was like, you know, apparently on the, on the up. And, you know, that gets ignored because when you talk about recession, you're talking about the sort of general picture for the whole UK. I mean, our sort of analysis at NEF um, last year was that between 2019 and 2021, the poorest 50% of the people were worse off. So they had their own mini recession, whereas the richest were, you know, either £400 better off on average or even the richest 5% were like £3,000 better off on average. So you know, when you consider that all together, you know, the, the whole UK might be looking like it's on the up, but when you sort of break down the picture, actually the poorest are getting poorer and the richer are getting richer. And, you know, that's the sort of constant effect of like the past, you know, 10 years of government policy is that that's what they've been interested in. So this current recession that we're in, I would probably say is more down to, you know, external factors like the war in Ukraine, like the impact the pandemic still has on uh, supply chains across the world. 
But these sort of mini recessions contained within the UK, that's definitely down to government policy. I mean, that's fascinating. It, it, you know, the, so the way in which recession is being used at the moment is in its very technical, specific term, as in what is, you know, it, by definition, a recession. But as it is, I mean, it, it's interesting as well. You know, we keep saying cost of living crisis, but as you mentioned, people have had a cost of living crisis now for, for months. And, and you know, and I want to come on to energy bills in a minute, but people have been unable to pay them for ages before this energy rise. You know, I think it's been a, a constant part of the narrative, hasn't it, that people have struggled between choose between heating and eating. So this isn't a... This isn't a recent phenomenon. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, the only thing that's recent about it is that it's just going to be affecting more and more people. And I, yeah, I think what the latest thing that came out from even like the Tories' own mouths was that this is going to be affecting people up to earning 45K. So, you know, well above like the average income in the UK. And yeah, it's going to be a much more widespread issue than it has been before. But yeah, as you say, some of the people have been feeding this for the past 10 years, maybe more. I wanted to ask about the energy bills because, um, you know, a lot of people are very aware that they're much higher in the UK than almost anywhere else. And obviously places like France have sort of uh, renationalised part of their energy in order to uh, lower the rising amounts. Other countries have, have had various other things, action they put in. But our energy bills are so are rising to such a ludicrously high amount. Why are they much higher than everywhere else? Is it entirely due to just the war in Ukraine, which, um, you know, uh, I mean, I've, I've got a, a lot of sort of uh, questions about that, but it is, that's, that's the excuse that we've been given. I mean, is, is that the main So, reason? yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of reasons. I'd say, like, to start off with, like, the war in Ukraine is usually, like, the reason why globally energy prices are up. But, yeah, as you say, like, countries are experiencing that differently and like that part is confusing to a lot of people so for one thing like the UK in general usually has higher um, energy costs than elsewhere just because you know we're an island it's harder to transport energy to us so that increases the cost for us in general there's also the fact that you know this is a gas slash oil crisis right so other countries in Europe um, will use sort of a higher amount of uh, nuclear power and they'll use a higher amount of re renewable energy sources and because we have less of that in the UK we're more reliant on these gas and oil prices and therefore sort of the average price that we're you know um, using is going much higher up compared to countries where they can rely more on um, nuclear and renewable energy but I think the last one and then it's actually the most important point is that yeah as you say with like places like France where they have a nationalized energy um, suppliers and yeah across Europe as well in those countries they're basically just allowing the nationalized energy company to take the hit um, some countries are even just like fully just subsidizing um, these energy companies as well and like you know they're providing you know tens of billions worth of support just so the price is capped because particularly for France, it's quite interesting because despite their energy prices only going up by 4%, their sort of like raw energy costs have actually gone up by more than the UK. And that's because France is a country that is reliant on nuclear power, but because of climate change um, and all the droughts we had in the summer, it's actually made the price of like nuclear energy very, very expensive because they use water to cool the reactors and stuff like that. So, you know, the UK is experiencing higher than average energy costs than the rest of Europe, apart from France. But because France has an active government that is protecting its consumers, they're seeing a much lower price. How, how much is affected by the fact that, you know, all our energy is, is privatised as well? Because I think one of the sort of uh, things I always think when we hear it's the war in Ukraine, I always think, well, I didn't realise that affected companies getting massive profits I didn't, I didn't think sort of a direct result of war was shell taking you know 170 billion whatever it was but it, you know is 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 a part of it that because I, I believe it's our gas isn't it that we send we send over to france and then we we buy it straight back from them that's surely got to have an effect as well. yeah for sure i think the, the the thing with privatization as well is that i wouldn't say you're guaranteed that a nationalized energy company is going to be cheaper than a privatized energy company. It's just basically the fact that if a nationalized energy company is making, you know, obscene profits, they're obviously going to reinvest that into making bills cheaper. Whereas when you have a privatized company, there's no, you know, there's no mechanism to say that these profits need to be reinvested. So what's happening is 
the energy companies are just sort of doing what they're being told to, right? Because these price caps and stuff are being set by like government regulations. So they're doing what they're being told to do. And then the implication of that is that actually they're, you know, profiting a lot from this because, you know, another thing with energy companies is that they often, you know, buy their sort of supply of um, gas and oil and et cetera um, in the future. So they buy it like say two years ago when the market was predicting a much lower price and therefore they're be, they're able to, you know, make a big profit from the fact that, the average price is much higher now. So like that's, you know, a source of where their profits are coming from because at the end of the day, if they want to buy any new energy, they're still sort of having to buy at this much higher global price. But yeah, together, you put that together and they're earning obscene profits and there's just no way for the government to claw that back other than maybe for, you know, a windfall tax like lots of people are calling for, but no sign that's coming, so... Well, that, that's what I wanted to ask you next. Is you know, I, I mean, well, I suppose we should we should first talk about what Liz Truss's supposed plan is. We, we, I should say for the listeners, we're talking on Wednesday. We still don't really know for sure what uh, what the plans entirely are. We haven't had all the full details, but supposedly she's suggesting that they'll freeze uh, freeze prices, and then we will be. Well, again, it's a bit. We're not not entirely sure yet, but it sounds like we will be paying off the cost of freezing them for 20 to 40 years by a sort of levy. Um, is 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 that a good idea? And I, and I suppose the, the more important question is, what would be a good idea? What would be an actually viable way to, to fix this that, that benefits us and perhaps also, you know, more importantly, focuses on, on, on climate change goals? Yeah, so the current proposal sort of going around at the moment is this, like, price cap freeze. Um, and I guess sort of main issue with it is that it'd be, like, you know, really, really expensive, about like 100 billion plus. And, you know, there's always a question when the government's going to be spending money, is it, could it be better spent elsewhere? Um, I think a lot of people are saying it might be necessary because people aren't going to be able to afford their bills um, otherwise. But there's an important point with the freeze that it's actually maybe going to be quite regressive because richer people that, um, you know, use more energy would have seen, you know, much higher rises in their bills. So they're essentially going to be, you know, subsidised, you know, two to three thousand pounds per household, whereas a poorer household in this sense would only be benefiting, you know, around a thousand pounds. So you have to think of in sort of those terms that, yeah, richer people are probably going to benefit a lot more from this. And then further, you know, the reason we're having this energy crisis is because, you know, there's global shortages because of, you know, the war in Ukraine. So we really want to be sort of um, incentivizing people cutting down their energy usage, right? Because, you know, there's already been reports in the news that like some, you know, government departments are preparing for like blackouts and um, power cuts and stuff like that. So, you know, if we if we keep with this scheme of just freezing the price cap, people aren't going to be, you know, changing their energy usage because they're going to be paying the same amount. So like there is actually quite a concern there where if you're not actually dis- disincentivizing anything that people are just going to carry on using energy like they do and then that's going to lead to you know those shortages becoming real and causing people to have their energy cut off um yeah on, on other proposals uh yeah we, we at nef um recently came out with um a proposal which would sort of create like a universal basic energy entitlement so everyone would get around um, 2,000 kilowatt hours of electricity and 8,000 kilowatt hours of gas for free before having to pay anything. And that's about um, just over 50% of like the average uh, usage of um, households across the UK. And then the the way we would make this sort of um, affordable is that the implied price of gas and electricity above that would actually be much higher than... Um, we currently pay but because obviously on average you would still be paying less because you're getting that sort of basic entitlement free i think we calculated um that based on a six thousand pound energy price cap for april 2023 this would be worth about four thousand pounds of um that um uh, energy bill so yeah about two-thirds of your energy free um 
yeah and then the, the good thing about this because the energy would be so expensive at the higher level it would hopefully sort of um disincentivize people to um yeah cut down their energy usage because yeah for every extra um thing they turn on they're going to be paying a lot more um and then yeah i mean i think the, the thing with this is that a lot of the solutions to this like energy crisis are way more long term so like another thing that we're, we're supporting is this idea of um retrofitting homes so making homes more energy efficient because higher energy efficiency means what they use less energy but also in general just means that people have warmer and more high quality homes which is you know a good thing in itself so um but that obviously can't be done over a day so i think alongside this sort of um you know reform to the energy markets we also want to see you know quite generous um universal payments and um boosts to like benefits and universal credit and etc so like we've proposed a 750 pound universal payment to everyone and then a thousand pound boost to benefits with 650 pounds extra for um families and couples and therefore like if you put that all together we would our calculations and say that um, the poorest 50% of the UK would be £1,500 better off compared to the situation where the price cap is enforced at £6,000, where they would be £3,000 worse off. So, yeah, quite a big jump. But, you know, the benefit of this proposal is because it's sort of working on the fact that rich people are paying much more for their higher energy consumption. Um, the cost of it in total, compared to the Tories package, which people are saying is going to be costing about 100 billion is costing you know only 40 billion so there's like a a big difference in cost there and that means you know 60 billion could go elsewhere in the economy like the nhs etc 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 so there's um yeah a, an argument here for the fact you use this sort of redistribution of um energy expenditure by like yeah um giving out a free portion and therefore people that use less energy are going to be paying much less and people that use much more energy are going to be paying much more whilst also hopefully discouraging them from having high energy usage and therefore hopefully avoiding these uh, blackouts and uh, power cuts. Yeah, I mean, that, that seems uh, that seems just incredibly fair and, and very sensible. And, and I suppose you say, you know, the issue is right now, we've got we've got the problem right now and we have to deal with it right now. And uh, this is going to be an ongoing problem. It will need long term solutions, but you've got to do something at the moment uh, to stop people falling into uh, a catastrophe. And, and you know, I, I wondered as well that all what you were mentioning is, is about supporting people. And is that that's what we need at the moment, I guess, to support an overall recession um, and to curb further inflation? Because, again, a lot of the um, a lot of the sort of what uh, especially sort of cabinet ministers have said is that raising workers wages would cause higher inflation. Is Is there any truth in that at all? Because. I, you know, I have a terrible knowledge of economics, to, you know, apart from when I listen to obviously a New Economic Foundation uh, podcast, and read all your stuff. but my understanding is awful. But, it, you know, to me, it seems if we all have more money to spend, that can go back into the economy and, and keep things rolling. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah, the, the basics of inflation are it's usually caused by like two sides of the economy. Right. So there's the supply side where if you have supply issues and that increases the cost of like raw materials, then your inflation is going to go up because, yeah, like the raw materials that make everything are becoming more expensive. And therefore, businesses, if they want to sort of maintain their profit margins, are going to charge more. Um the, that's sort of the inflation we're seeing at the moment and I think there's actually also an argument that um, some businesses are being quite greedy about it and also um, getting much higher profit margins than they would normally just because they're seeing you know other people are able to rise the price raise the price so they're taking the opportunity to do it as well um, I think there is an argument that, you know, some inflation is being caused by demand. But if you look at sort of like the government statistics on like expenditure and stuff, um, the sort of volume of what people are buying is going down. So like, although we're sort of spending roughly the same amount because everything is more expensive, the volume of goods that uh, people are buying is going down. So like the demand argument seems quite weak because of that, because well, actually 
people aren't buying more things so why would firms be you know increasing the price because of that it's um not the issue but yeah the argument is is that you know if people's incomes were to rise maybe that would start becoming an issue but i think you're right in to say you know if people's uh, incomes rise then that actually could have a sort of its own economic growth effect because if more people are buying more goods then more people can start running a business meaning there's more um goods in the economy and services and therefore you know that's being spread out without having sort of a pressure on prices to rise um and i think yeah like there's, there's also just this other thing that like inflation by itself probably isn't so bad if wages are catching up so like you know the reason like 10% inflation is such like a massive issue at the moment is because wages are going up by like you know 0 to 5%. So it, it it takes a massive hit to people's incomes whereas if you know wages were increasing by the same amount I think you know while inflation would still be an issue for maybe like people that are living off their savings or um people that um or, or just like the general um, instability that inflation brings because you don't want prices rising all the time because that can lead to sort of uncertainty in the economy. But yeah, if, if people's wages were rising, they wouldn't really um, feel that effect. And then, you know, the tools that we actually do use to combat inflation when it's on this demand side is by raising interest rates. So like that would then aid... Um, the people that are living off their savings and it would then um also make the impact more neutral over time so yeah i think you have to think about you know what tools do we use to combat inflation and how that sort of um benefits different people is it would, would sort of um you know overall uh wage increases be enough because i know scotland have just announced that they're freezing rent uh, and they're freezing rail fares both of which i sound amazing <laughs> to me i was like oh, i might have to I again think might have to move northwards um but you know is is would just raising wages be enough because so much of uh society we mentioned before people couldn't afford to pay their heating bills before they rose rent prices keep increasing so much seems to be getting more and more expensive even before uh this cost of living crisis so you know is is wages enough does i'm assuming we need a whole raft of measures to control things so that, so that you know more people could could live normally i suppose yeah I, I think it's a good point and i think you know the past sort of 10 years austerity has sort of you know cut away a lot of um state services that you know we're free at the point of use and etc and i think if you if you think about it that way a lot of people's cost of living has increased not just because um you know prices are increasing but literally because services that they used to be able to access for free funded by the government have now you know vanished and therefore they have to you know seek private alternatives you know for example it's much harder for people to get like an nhs de- dentist now it's much harder for people to seek like mental health help through the nhs it's much harder to you know get an appointment and people are going to private healthcare for that some people yeah yeah also just the fact that like um tra- transport departments are funded much worse and cuts to council budgets have also made um you know public transport much more expensive so like you know you you put all those issues together and maybe you know austerity is also to blame for the rising cost of living especially for you know those sort of basic essentials of like healthcare and transport and stuff that was you know historically provided quite well by uh, local government and central government so yeah i think there's also maybe an argument there where you know bringing back a lot of these things into government hands where they can be cheaper like is you know probably a a good idea as well yeah childcare is being a a ticket well we're just about to stop paying for childcare for like i'm so excited it's 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 just been absolutely brutal um i I wanted to well in fact i'm gonna ask you another question here but I, i you know at the moment um in the 
I say likely event that, that fiscal policy under and Liz Truss's government isn't too different from previous governments, but I suppose we don't really know as yet what it's going to be like. Um, and, and I've got to be careful how I ask this because I don't want this to be like a, what are the ways you can be more energy efficient at home? Do all those nonsense about doing star jumps and all that. I, that isn't what I want to ask. But are there things that people can do sort of to lessen the effects of the cost of living crisis for themselves in terms of like community action? Is there, are there local things people can do? Are there ways in which people can help each other? Or is this now of such a scale um, that that it just needs government intervention and, and there's not really anything else that, that can be done? I, I think short term, probably like community action isn't the way to go. I think you know, community action, if you want long term change, so that's either, you know, political campaigns at the local level to you know provide better local services or um you know charitable volunteering actions at like food banks etc cetera, etc cetera. but i think you know we don't necessarily actually want there to be food banks we want people to be able to um afford the cost of living by itself and i think um that's going to require government action i think Maybe, you know, short term things people could do, though, is, you know, join a union or, you know, start becoming more politically active because, you know, it's, it's no coincidence that we have, you know, all this like industrial action and strikes on like transport services recently because, you know, transport workers, fortunately, are, you know, a very well unionized industry and that's why they get to be paid so well and that's why they're, you know, much more militant when they're given a bad deal so like i think um yeah just people becoming a bit more say like politically aware of their surroundings but also sort of understanding that you know if if they do this sort of organizing they probably can make a difference um because yeah i mean you mentioned earlier like you know scott scotland um freezing uh, social rents and that was sort of a direct um consequence of like on the ground campaigning of uh, different social tenants so you know these things can work but yeah at the same at the same time that was a government action that happened so like it's um it's something that the government does need to step in to solve but i think yeah a lot of people can find power in their local community yeah, that's. I, I think always just have this sort of vague hope of maybe there's something we can do without them <laughs> because I've got no faith that they'll do anything. And sort of remembering uh, like the Isle of Egg, I think bought their own, managed to nationalise their own energy. Obviously, very tiny island doesn't really apply to an entire, uh, the entire rest of the country. But you know, in my head, sometimes I think well, if we could just take this away from them and do it ourselves. Um, it, it, it sort of, uh, uh, with that respect, um, I'm going to put you on the spot here, and I apologise for this, but are, are you hopeful that? something will come in to lessen this because it seems like it's going to be so drastic. There's so many businesses that I mean, not just people are horribly at threat, but also small businesses are at threat. Whole uh, institutions are at threat. You know, schools are talking about having to close. It feels like the government are going to have to do something. Are you, are you hopeful that whether it may be enough or not, that, that something might come through or do you think that it could be still catastrophic? Well, yeah, I mean, hopefully if the rumours are true about like an energy price freeze, I think that would you know do a lot of good and it would stop people from going to like literal crisis i i think that yeah the problems with it are as i said it, it's potentially quite regressive and it doesn't really do anything to stop people overusing energy so you know wh whether that leads to a winter of you know blackouts and um power cuts i'm not sure but it certainly will hopefully prevent a winter of you know people being in like literal poverty and starving and freezing so you know um that that's the bright side of it <laughs> but you know they're not two of the best options so yeah i think hopefully something will come um and hopefully they'll you know be our expectations but the sort of rumored package at the moment um would definitely be an improvement
That's, I, I can take even a little bit of it being slightly better. I'll take <laughs> that hope. That's that's fine. That's great. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, well, thank you so much though, for having time. And, and and the last question I want to ask you, which is just that I ask all the guests that come on the show, uh, which is that apart from yourself and obviously New Economics uh, Foundation, what and who else would you recommend that listeners check out or follow for actually informative economic opinions and advice? I mean, who, who are the people that you like to go yeah, to? Yeah, I mean, I don't have like a list of names, but you know, usually the Financial Times, The Economist and The Guardian have very like sort of well-informed articles on economics that aren't so um, informed by just like actual politics and sort of actually talk to like the economic theories and sort of, you know, w- what academics are talking about as well. I'd also say, you know, those can be quite technical. So like for something a bit more uh, simple, there's like the Trade Union Congress. They always, they always uh, publish reports on the economy and economics and the outlook for the UK, which can be, you know, very insightful and, you know, also a good place to learn about like the impact of unions on the economy as well. Thanks tons to Dominic and also to Becky at the New Economics Foundation for helping to arrange the interview. Um, NEF can be found at neweconomics.org or on Twitter at NEF, Facebook at New Economics and Instagram at New Economics Foundation. Um, Also, their brilliant, brilliant New Economics podcast is very worth a listen uh, and a subscribe to as well. I listen to it quite often. They honestly help explain so many things that my brain is too stupid to get otherwise. Uh, Dominic himself can also be found on Twitter at Dominic Caddick too. Who else? What else? There must be some subjects I've not had on this podcast. Um, I'd love to talk to someone about why on earth we still have a monarchy. Obviously not this week, you know, we'll give it the 10 days. Um, but also love any hopeful chats uh, if such things exist. Send them all my way at partlypoliticalbroadcast at gmail.com. <laughs> And that's the end of this episode's long reign over your ears. There will now be a period of mourning for seven days, after which there'll be a new one. Yes, this podcast is exactly like the monarchy, just without the excessive wealth, damaging land ownership, or years of helping colonisation. Or the nice hats. But otherwise, exactly the same. Yeah. And in the time between this royally um, audio episode departing and the next uh, ascending, please do spread the word to gain it more loyal subjects, give it a review on, on one of its many podcast homes, and if you can, chuck a few quid to the Patreon or Kofi too. Thank you, Acast, my brother, last skeptic, and Cat Day for everything. This will be back next week when absolutely nothing will have happened because tradition. Bye. This week's show was sponsored by Liz Truss. Puts you to rest. All of the Prime Minister's longest speeches set to the ambient sounds of fracking to send you into the deepest sleep, just like she may or may not have done with the Queen. Hours and hours of droning on about delivering things or types of cheese in order to cancel out all brain activity you may have and help you pass out regardless of how cold your home is. Liz Trust puts you to rest. Available now for delivery, delivery, delivery. (laughs) 